Well, hello. Welcome to the Miked Up Podcast. I'm here with uh, two of our team members, Alvin Key and Caleb Deaton. And we're here to continue our discussion from this past Sunday. This is actually our, my second podcast for the week because we had to make one up. Double time. Double time. Double duty. But today we're going to uh, lean more into our conversation as we've been in this series called Sunday School. I was thinking this morning, this Sunday School series, we could probably just keep going for a while because there's so many topics that are worth covering that I think probably uh, a lot of the body of Christ, a lot of the church, maybe I could only speak for Life Church, it would serve us well to dig into, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But this week, uh, Caleb, you brought a great message about the church. Thank you. Great message about the church. And uh, it's such an, uh, a topic that is... Um, so broad, it would be impossible to take 30 or 40 minutes and cover it. So I'm mm-hmm. glad we get a chance to dive into this conversation. Yeah. Are y'all ready? Let's go. Ready as I, I'll ever be. I feel the excitement in the room today. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Uh, so let me just start with this. Alvin, uh, rather than asking him, but what were some of the highlights for you from the message on Sunday? One thing that really uh, I had never heard before and just stood out to me that I really enjoyed uh, was you were talking about Paul talking about the body of Christ and how perhaps he got that revelation uh, whenever uh, he's on his way to persecute Christians mm-hmm. and Jesus knocks him off of his horse or donkey or whatever it was. Hey, you said horse. I don't actually I think, think it, was it was a, a horse. Was it a donkey? I think there's another word we could put in there. You know, he got knocked off of his, but we'll just leave it there, right? <laughs> and uh, he's blinded and got, and Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And man, when you said that, it's just like, whoa, it opened up my mind to see it in a new way Mm -hmm. because Jesus, like you said, was identifying with his church. He didn't Mm -hmm. say, why are you persecuting my people? Mm -hmm. Why are you persecuting my church? No, why are you persecuting me? Because that is my body. And so I just thought, man, what a cool revelation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had. I don't know that I had made that connection before, but that was a great connection to Paul's metaphor of the church as the body of Christ. Yeah. So I thought that was incredible. Yeah, I think also you you touched on a lot of the images or metaphors that um, that Scripture reveals about the church, right? Because not one metaphor, I think, is a complete uh, expression of what Jesus is building. Mm -hmm. But you you mentioned that it is the body of Christ. It's the temple of God. It's the dwelling place of God in the earth, the bride of Christ, the people of God. Uh, and those are all metaphors that help us to understand this. And you made this great distinction, not organization that we're a part of, but an organism Mm -hmm. that we're a part of. And so, uh, man, it was just, just great. Let's lean more into it. Just just for review, the three big points, Caleb, do you want to review your three points? Do you, have, do you have the notes in front of you? Yeah, you don't have the notes in front of you, do you? <laughs> That's like I just threw you under the bus yeah. right there. Is that what? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, so first, the church is a place of community. Mm-hmm. Secondly, the church is a place of oh, commitment. Man. Boy, we could mm-hmm. talk about that for a while because that word's lost in 2024, in, in society in general, and unfortunately also in the church, but that was great. Mm-hmm. And you just talked about how the church was devoted to the Apostles' Doctrine, the breaking of bread, the fellowship of prayers, mm-hmm. Acts 2, 42 through 47. And then it's a place of power, power. place of power. So that's incredible. Uh, and, and really, the first thing, it's a place of community. Uh, I love how you, you made the distinction, like, it's not community for community's sake. So mm-hmm. just talk about that for a minute. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of places that you can gather and get community that's great um but what sets the community of believers apart is that we're a community of believers mm-hmm. that um we we're here gathering on purpose and it's because of our faith in jesus mm-hmm. it's what unites us what's what separates us um yes yeah, so it's it's, sig- it's what makes it significant yeah than exactly. just oh you know i had fun with uh there's so much more to it than just we gathered and you know, had some food. Yeah, gather and have some food. So then you just talked about how, like, one of the first things the church is to do is to gather. And that's really what mm-hmm. a lot of the message was about. So is the gathering, the coming together, the connection. I love Hebrews 10. It says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, mm-hmm. uh, as is the habit of some. Yep. Uh, but that, that word just has a lot of different connotations, right? And I think it includes us getting together on a regular basis. But the body, unless the members of the body are connected, like if my hand's disconnected from my wrist, then it serves no function. Mm-hmm. So there has to be a connection. 
and you know you buy something and oftentimes on the little, the little fine print it says some assembly required in other words if you don't put all these parts together you're just going to have a bunch of individual parts that serve no purpose right. when you put them all together when they are assembled and that's really the church man when the church is assembled in that mm-hmm. manner uh but it's assembled for a purpose right right so uh without it being assembled without us coming together mm-hmm. right what's what's the point yeah, very little significance, very little value. Very little value. Yeah. Uh, and Jesus didn't call his body together to just assemble, I don't think. Right, yeah. Maybe this would be a good time to ask you the question, what would be your philosophy of the gathering, the purpose of the gathering? Well, that's a great, that's a, well, that's a huge question. And I think, um, you know, I have friends whose philosophies might differ from mine. Uh, I, I, I view what we do on a regular basis. For us, it's on Sundays. Uh, I view it as the gathering of believers, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we gather with an awareness that there might be unbelievers in our midst. Right. And I think that's always important to remember. But we don't gather for the purpose of unbelievers. Mm-hmm. That's my philosophy, right? Uh, I'm always sensitive. I love to give salvation altar call when we come together. For sure. Right? M- my prayer, my hope is that there's unbelievers in the midst. But for us, for me, the reason we gather is not for unbelievers. It's for the building up of the saints so they can do the work of ministry. Um, it's interesting that in Acts, the Bible says, the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. Mm-hmm. I would assert that didn't happen when the church gathered. It's when the church went out into the world amidst their daily lives and lived out kingdom life that was appealing to other people where they were sharing the gospel, sharing their faith, not just verbally, but sharing it by living it out. And that became attractional. That's what mm-hmm. I believe. Right? Yeah. Right. And, and then the gathering is for the encouraging edification. The building up. The equipping. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think the gathering happens in multiple uh, multiple ways. I don't think it's just a Sunday thing. That's yeah. why we have life groups. Alvin, you oversee our life groups. Why? Because the larger any local expression of the church becomes, the smaller it has to be so that there are authentic connections, yeah. relationship points, equipping. Yeah. And you see that exact same thing in Acts where you have bigger gatherings and then they'd meet in homes yeah they, they gathered they, in the temple and yeah. in each other's homes and yeah. in each other's homes and in corinthians you see too and paul kind of talks about how hey you're going to have onlookers and he kind of within the context of the gifts yeah specifically, specifically speaking in tongues like hey be aware that you have onlookers people are going to be attracted by mm-hmm. your guys' devotion and people are going to stop by and the gathering is for the believers. Gathering is for the believers. Gatherings, yeah. So yeah, yeah, that's right. And then the purpose of the church is to uh, uh, it, it, the church is Jesus means of I'm going to use this term advancing His kingdom or establishing His kingdom in the hearts of men and in the earth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. That is His original plan. In 2024, that's still His plan. And on, as long as the earth remains, that will be his plans. That's what scripture reveals. Yeah, right. I mean, I would say, and be interested in what you say, but there's kind of like a priority. And if you get the priority off, it's weird. So, for instance, hey, we come and we worship God. Mm-hmm. And we offer our sacrifices to him, mm-hmm. first and foremost. And then we are building each other up. We're equipped for the work of ministry. Mm-hmm. And we're and, ministering one to another. And we're ministering one to another. Mm-hmm. We're building each other up. And then we go. Mm-hmm. And if we get that all mix, mixed up, it's weird. Yeah. You know, if we go try to reach everyone first. Yeah. So, so the question is, is the church a gathering place or is it a going place? And the answer is, it's not either or, it's both and. Right. And we'll never fulfill our function of going into all the world. If we don't gather and are built up by what Ephesians, Paul says in Ephesians, by what every joint supplies. Mm -hmm. There's a reason we're connected. Because you give something to me that I don't have that's going to help me fulfill my function in the earth. Not in just the context of the church, but in the earth. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. What are you thinking, Alvin? The scripture was coming to my mind, too. uh, Spur one another on. 
uh, spur one another onto good works Mm -hmm. and like even when we're gathering together and encouraging one another and helping each other live holy lives before god i mean i think all of that is part of it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like you talked about it's not just community for community's sake there's a lot of places people can just go for community and i think even a lot of times there's people that just want to come to commute come to church because they just want a community but Mm -hmm. a community without a mission is kind of pointless like it's just just sitting around but we have a mission we have a purpose we have a focus yeah. mm-hmm. and so i've heard nathan finocchio put it this way one time he said um you know our first priority is to worship god mm-hmm. second priority is the edification of believers and the third priority is reaching the lost mm-hmm. and so i love how you guys are saying that like when we get things out of order and we're trying to put the lost first in our gatherings and we're trying to cater everything to them we're missing our first priority which is worshiping god Mm -hmm. and our next priority which is building each other up Mm -hmm. and uh yeah so keeping the main thing the main thing yeah i think in certain let let me just be clear too uh i think there are probably certain i'm I'm trying to i'm trying to find the word the right word for this so i don't get myself in trouble uh I, i i'm not gonna um deny the fact that there probably are certain leaders of churches who are graced maybe differently than me Mm -hmm. and and therefore their church is planted with a very potentially even their gathering more evangelistic purpose i think Mm -hmm. that's within the realm of possibility yeah and if every church looks identically the same one of us isn't needed Mm-hmm. Right, so which just like there's different people in every local church for a purpose, mm-hmm. uh, I think every church has potentially a different function and can serve a different function. Uh, I'm just talking about our philosophy and the way we see mm-hmm. Scripture and the way we operate here at Life Church. And let's be clear: the mission of the church isn't to gather. The mission of the church is to go into all the world. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. who is the church? The believers gather. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the church isn't the organization. Mm-hmm. Like, really, the church is the people that make up the organism, mm-hmm. right? And uh, and so it's the responsibility of every believer to go into all the world. They're already in the world, though, mm-hmm. right? Like, we don't have to have an organized ministry for believers to go into all the world because they where they work where they live is the world they're called to Mm -hmm. what would happen if we all embraced that place as our place of ministry let me put it this way that we recognize god's already given us a platform and within the context of my relationship with brothers and sisters in christ i'm discipled and with the gifts god's given there and the leadership that god places in the local house where he set me i'm equipped to step out onto the platform that god's given me in the sphere where he set me in the world oftentimes i say to our people before we leave and before we pronounce a blessing on them hey you are now going in into the world right Mm -hmm. you're going into your assignment into your place of ministry and uh, just imagine if we all started living with that mm-hmm. as the church, because that is the ministry. That is the function of the church. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes, we gather, but we gather so we can be equipped to go. Yeah. Some people's goal, it seems like, is to like, they want to make it to full-time ministry. And it's like, you already are in full-time ministry. Yeah. Like maybe you're missing your opportunity that's right in front of you. Yeah. You know, full-time ministry isn't working at a church. Full-time ministry is your daily life. Your daily mm-hmm. life. That's one thing my my dad has said. He started our church in, uh, in 1986, and he pastored before. As long as I can remember, he said, every believer is called to full-time ministry. Yeah. Some people are called vocation into vocational ministry, and if you can get away from it and run from it, do, because if you can, <laughs> then you're not called, and if you're not called, you don't need to be there. But every believer is called into full-time ministry. I mm-hmm. believe that. Yeah. I believe that. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So this, this thing uh, that is not an organization is an organism, but it needs structure. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, every <coughs> living thing has some kind of structure. Uh, imagine if we had life breathed into us and there was no structure to support the life. No bones. No skeletal structure. <laughs> Just right? blobs. Not only is there a skeletal structure, but there's systems. You're going to be all right, man? <laughs> you need Alvin's water there or something, man. We, we're going to pause Breathe. for a 30-second commercial for bottled water and Hall's cough drops here. 
Um, so uh, what was I saying? Y'all remember what I was saying? Oh, structure and systems, right? Yes. Not only does our body have a skeletal structure, it's got a circulatory system. Yeah. So the blood can flow, so we can breathe, mm -hmm. right? Like it's got a digestive system. Just think it's got a nervous system. Think of all the systems of the body. Think of Paul's metaphor of the church. Uh, there was life breathed into this thing on the day of Pentecost. It took years for some organizational structure to come. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, in Acts 6, we see what we believe are deacons that were appointed, men full of faith in the Holy Ghost. But we see they had a ministry. What's a deacon ministry? Serving. Mm -hmm. What was their responsibility? Make sure that the widows were cared for and the people had food. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then later on, we see that there were this thing called elders. And they're, they're, now we see these grace gifts called apostle, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. We see this word show up in Timothy, bishops. Mm -hmm. Right. So then then later on, this thing that has life gets structured because everything that has life needs structure and system to support the life. Mm -hmm. They're never there to uh, get in the way of life. They're actually there to facilitate the life. Yeah. Right. That's so this true. thing has. And here's what happens. Oftentimes people get bothered by the structure and system that's necessary to support the life that, that the Holy Spirit's breathed into the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think in our culture today, I need you guys to chime into this, especially with your age. Like I think a lot of people your age uh, uh, experience this. In my view is that there is a high anti-establishment culture right. in the earth, right? Uh, everybody's skeptical, honestly, with valid reasons of government, mm -hmm. of leaders, of all this stuff, that same skepticism is now projected into the church to where we have like almost an anti-church thing. What, 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 they all speak into that. What's your perspective? Yeah, I mean, obviously there's a real big trust issue with leadership and structures and um, establishments. And, um, I mean... Obviously, even within this week's news cycle, mm. you see it so within the yeah. church that, hey, man, men fail. Yeah, yeah. And Leaders are human. Yeah. Pastors and are humans. Should yeah. be rightfully disciplined and what, whatever that looks like. It's um, And it's still God's idea. And just because we're not an organization, we're an organism, like we're, we're a life, that doesn't mean we're not organized. That doesn't mean there's not structure. God designs scru structure that we see in Scripture. And I think there's a lot of running from structure, mm -hmm. and all we end up having is this thing we call church that isn't church that we see in Scripture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even and the Godhead has structure to it, right? right. Father, mm -hmm. Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I don't do anything the Father's not saying. Holy Spirit says, the only thing I can do is what the... What does He reveal? He reveals the heart of the Father, right? Yeah, so there's yeah. actually some kind of structure even within the Godhead. Right. Yeah. And, um, yeah, really, I feel like it's just man's fearful response and rebellious response. Ooh. Like, our generation, and even just America in general, because that's really all I can talk about, is we're, we're, we kind of have a rebellious culture. Right, the the biggest trends are rebellious of the previous generation's rules, whether good or bad, whatever. Either way, that the trend is the rebellion of the previous generation, and um, that's somewhat fine within American culture, just not in the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think a lot of times we're just actually rebelling against God's design way of things. Mm. Yeah. And there's a lot of people who have been what they would call church hurt, what we would probably call people hurt, and you can elaborate more on that if you'd like, But because um, people hurt people. And mm -hmm. um, I think that they allow that to shape their view of Scripture and what God created and what He put in the earth. For instance, my personal like life example, back uh, where I grew up in Lake City, I was a part of a church in our church, in our city, there was an actual cult, like a real cult, that was pretty big. Like a bunch of people have moved there from like Utah or something. And uh, it had been there for a couple of generations. I mean, some people had been raised their whole lives in this thing. And uh, stuff happened with the leader. Uh, 
Woo, we're having all kinds of fun today in the <laughs> podcast. You all right, man? <laughs> Breathe, homie. Let me on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you have to stop smoking, man. <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. We don't need those rumors out there. Okay. Uh, so a lot of people had been hurt from what had happened. And so all these people scattered from this cult, and they started coming to all these different churches in Lake City, where I'm from. And they kept running into an issue where because they had been so hurt and they were so distrustful of leadership because, mm. I mean, obviously they, they had been hurt and been uh, deceived by certain people, uh, they didn't trust any leadership and they were super anti-establishment and they just wouldn't stick in any church or in any fellowship in any community for very long because they just could not handle having somebody in authority over them spiritually which we see in Scripture. And so I remember having conversations with these people and bringing up Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. I mean, Ephesians 4.12, God put in place apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. That's structure. Those are governmental offices. And they just... They just didn't want to hear it. They just didn't want to hear Scripture itself. And they would... And it's unfortunate, but a lot of them are still kind of just floundering and meandering and they're not really connected anywhere. Um, And that's just an unfortunate reality. But here's what we need to remember when we see things like that or we see leaders fall. For every leader that falls, there's 10 leaders who are doing their job faithfully and serving Jesus. And it's so... uh, Our culture loves to put people on a platform and then tear them down. And we love to like dig into all the gritty details of what happened. But uh, we love to blow that up and put that on social media. But for every leader that falls, there are 10 more that are doing their job faithfully. Yeah. And they're doing it behind the scenes without any fame, without any uh, cameras without on. Without an Instagram following, without yeah. a social media following, whatever. Yeah, it's so good. You, yeah. you kind of, you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to echo kind of what he said. Just because you were hurt doesn't mean God is wrong. Exactly. Yeah. Say that one more yeah. time. <laughs> just because you were hurt. Or I can say just because I was hurt doesn't mean God is wrong. Mm-hmm. And yeah. So. Yeah. In Matthew, Jesus said, no, Matthew records Jesus' words, better way to say it, uh, that he, I will build my church and the mm-hmm. gates of hell will not prevail against it. I think he will build. I think he has built and he will continue to build. Yeah. The church is something always in process because it's made up of this thing called humans, mm-hmm. right? The human species new creations in Christ, those that are still becoming new, those that are still work in progress, are what are being built together as this church. Mm -hmm. So that means Jesus' church is always in progress. So people are going to get hurt because they're assembled with other people, with leaders who are humans, whose tendency it is to hurt others. I can never be hurt by somebody I'm not in relationship with. Mm Mm-hmm. And the reason people in church that experience hurt is because we actually risk being in relationship with somebody and we get close to somebody and then we get hurt. I'm on a personal mission. I'm going to look into the cameras. I'm on a personal mission to annihilate the term church hurt because when we allow that to be part of our vocabulary, we allow ourselves to despise an organism or a structure that Jesus is building, that Jesus died for. And as believers, we cannot allow there to be a spite in our heart towards what Jesus is building, Mm -hmm. right? His bride. So so let's call it, you you Mm -hmm. called it what it is, Alvin, and and I want to call it as you've not been hurt by the church, you've been hurt by people. Mm -hmm. Those people are in the church, but it is not the church. So stop blaming the church and let's learn to forgive people. Mm -hmm. And I can get passionate about that because I've been hurt by people in the church. I've been in church since the first Sunday I was alive. I'm a PK. I don't know people that have been more hurt by people in the church than people that have grown up as pastor's kids because it's crazy. Matter of fact, I'm just going to share this stat. I've shared it with a lot of my pastor friends, but a guy named Ed Young pastors a church in in Dallas, Texas, big church. He was doing a session, and I believe it was pastor's kids, wasn't it? Or pastors. I don't know, probably. Yeah, and uh, he shared this stat, and I'm trying to find his, his source for it. It's probably true. And he said this, the average person loses seven significant relationships in a year. No, no, no. 
Huh? The average person loses seven, seven in, significant in their lifetime. In their lifetime. In their lifetime. In their lifetime. Thank you. Thank you for correcting me. In their lifetime. And the average pastor loses seven significant relationships per year. Mm. A severed relationship equals hurt. If people think when you lose relationships or those the, the dynamic of relationships changes radically, uh, and you think that pastors don't feel that and don't get hurt by it, then you think we're not human, right? Right. So that's been a, that kind of hurt and grief has been a part of my life. I'm not complaining about it. I'm I'm just expressing the reality. Like I don't need people to feel sorry for me. This is just the reality. I could easily have, as a teenager, blamed the church, right? Mm-hmm. But the reality is, I realized that's not the church. That's not Jesus Bride. That's members of Jesus' bride that are still in progress, mm-hmm. right? So I can't carry it against this thing Jesus is building because, look, I've hurt people. Mm-hmm. I've hurt people because I've been rude. I've hurt people accidentally because I did things. That, I've hurt people because I had to make decisions that I knew were going to hurt individuals, but it was for vision. It was for mm-hmm. the, And it's painful yeah. to know in that place where I'm making a decision and somebody's going to get hurt. I don't want people to get hurt. Right, and there's some decisions you have to make where no matter what you do, half the people are going to be mad at you. Oh yeah, it just happens, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, it is what it is. And I said all that to say, let's just, as the body of Christ, let's reframe it. It's not church hurt. I've been hurt by people. The problem with that is when I say that, then I have to actually take more responsibility for what I'm experiencing, and feeling, and what my choices are going forward. But if we can blame it on the church, then I don't have to take responsibility for it. Yeah, I don't have to own my contribution, right, or whatever. When it's people, then all of a sudden, if I understand Scripture, I've got to forgive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And there's people everywhere, too. The world will hurt you just as much or more than the church ever yeah. would. You know what I'm saying? Because like, yeah. people not only exist in the church, they're in the world. And in the world, they're talking about people who are unbelievers. They're not even... In a process of being trans, their minds being transformed and following God and becoming more like Him. So, I mean, you well, think- I think I think the reality is though, uh, and, and this is fair. I would say it's fair. Yeah. We have a greater expectation of people that are in relationship with Jesus than people that aren't in relationship with Jesus. Mm-hmm. And I think yeah. that's fair. Yeah, nothing wrong with that, as long as we also have the awareness. And when the that expe- those people we have great greater expectation of are also human. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when you have a greater expectation of someone, it hurts way worse. It hurts For way. Instance, that's what exactly. If you were to hurt getting. me. As my father, it would hurt way worse than if Alvin were to hurt. That's me. right. Because and I have, I have said, I have said things that hurt. Right. And so we're not. And, we're, and you don't reject fatherhood. Saying, you don't reject right. fatherhood because your dad has said things that have hurt you. Right. And yeah, we're not saying that hurt doesn't exist, or as we've called it, church hurt doesn't exist. There's places where people abuse their power and all that. Mm-hmm. And the reframing is, it's people that hurt you. It's people that abuse. And their let's power. not That's let right. hurt disconnect us from. A life source from right? a life source. Members of a body. When the body's dismembered, uh-huh. there's no life. Or to say we got to get rid of all authority in church because scripture actually outlines that there's authority in church. Right. I mean, I I don't like this scripture. I don't. I I think when I was a younger pastor, I used it, and I now I realize that was probably really stupid for a younger <laughs> pastor to use this verse. Uh, and, and and I don't remember the last time I actually used it in any teaching. But Hebrews 13 is pretty strong. It, it's kind of scary, actually. It actually says, obey those that have rule over you and submit to them because they watch out for your souls. And he's talking about spiritual, like church leadership, not just government. Yeah, it's yeah. Specifically the, it's, the church. The context is those that rule over you. And then, you know, it combine that to where Paul says, let the el- or Peter says, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. So these elders, so he's actually talking about leadership of the church, right? Uh, I don't lean into that. I'm not leaning into that today. I'm just saying don't reject the principles of Scripture because we have imperfect humans, right, that are empowered by Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. grace, by, grace by Jesus to actually lead mm-hmm. this thing because we are all in process. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what's cool about the church that Jesus left in the earth is there is a process for when people abuse their power or when people do fall short of the standard. You know, there it, there's a removal and... I mean, if you're in a healthy place, there's a removal, and that's dealt with. Or if you're not in a healthy place, find a healthy place, yeah, you know, where sure. you can be plugged in, because yeah. that's the standard. When people, but don't, don't abandon all authority, right? Yeah. yeah, 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 and that's such a thing 
in culture and it's it's well as americans we're, we're in a country of freedom and liberty don't tell me what to do uh, well i would say this i think there's a difference between freedom and liberty and independence Mm-hmm. And we've touted as Americans our independence, and we've taken on an independent spirit in the church. But Jesus never designed us to be independent. Right. He designed us to be interdependent. Yeah. Right? And freedom is mm-hmm. different than independence. And liberty in Christ is way different than liberty in the world. A hundred percent. Because Paul still said, I'm, I'm a slave to this thing. That's right. I, I'm a slave to righteousness. It doesn't sound like liberty mm-hmm. in an American context. Right. And he says, don't use your freedom to serve yourselves. Use your freedom to serve one another. Serve one yeah. another. Yeah, yeah. And let's be clear, too. Leadership in a kingdom context is never about a hierarchy of structure. It is about a... uh, I'm going to use the same word. I'm I'm trying to find a different word for it. A hierarchy of servanthood. Mm -hmm. Leaders in the body of Christ aren't over people. They're actually under people. Mm -hmm. That's the better picture, right? I'm I'm supporting you. I'm serving you. Uh, matter of fact, the Bible says the church, this thing that Jesus is building, is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. They're actually not over the church. They're actually up under the church supporting it, like mm. pushing it up, right? Yeah. And then I, I say this to our students every once in a while. If you can't obey your parents, you can't obey God. Yeah. And Where'd you learn that? Uh, <laughs> my parents. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think similarly, if you're constantly rebelling against authority... It's very, very possible you're rebelling against God, too. Very possible. Very possible. Yeah, so this thing that church, that Jesus is building, is beautiful. I had somebody tell me, man, the church is a mess. And I just, this was recently. And it was in a meeting. And I love them. And I just said, you know, I, I wholeheartedly disagree with you. I think that the church is Jesus' bride. And it's beautiful. And it is continuing in its beautification process, and it's still in process, and it's still being built, but I refuse to believe that the church is a mess. Are there pockets? Are there places where the church is a mess? Are, well, well, yeah, it's humans. It's never going to be perfect because it's made up of humans. It's led by humans. So if we expect perfection in the church, then we're always going to be disappointed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the church is so much bigger than your tiny little local context. Right. The mm-hmm. church is global. There are Christians suffering persecution all over the yeah. world and serving God faithfully. Yeah. The church is beautiful. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to take it beyond just being global. It's actually eternal. Yeah. Right? We're actually part of a 2,000-year momentum since the cross. So we've got early church fathers that have gone before us, saints that were martyred, right? Uh, Hebrews 12 talks about this great cloud. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. We're actually continuing on with everything that they began and the foundation that was laid, and we're building on it so it's global, but yet it's eternal. And we're actually building for those that are going to come behind us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? So that's a bigger that's a bigger Mm -hmm. conversation too yeah yeah so the church man i love i love the church Mm -hmm. i love the church it's not perfect i'm not perfect life church isn't perfect i don't know of one perfect church the 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 universal body of christ is not perfect and we are all in process of being perfected and it is god's idea jesus intent that we gather together in a local expression of the church right and then that local expression of the church embrace its mission to release sent ones, to see the body of Christ equipped to fulfill their purpose so that we uh, uh, advance the kingdom of God, we help establish the kingdom of God in the earth in context of all the other bodies that are doing. Like there's there's local bodies in in Fort Myers that we love. There are partners in advancing the kingdom, right? We need them to do what God's called them to do. We do what we're called to do. And thank God we don't have to do the same thing or look the same, but we can be the expression of Christ in the earth. I'm going to say it this way. Here's another way. We're called, the church is assembled together to embody Christ Mm -hmm. in the context in which it's set. Mm -hmm. That's the powerful thing about the church. Yeah. Right? So thanks for joining the Mic'd Up podcast. We've enjoyed taking this subject about the church. The ecclesia, boy, there's so many things. We didn't even touch on that Greek word, ecclesia. We could have taken it deeper. Thanks for joining us. Trust has been a blessing to you. If you've enjoyed it, make sure you like the podcast, share it with somebody, and make sure you subscribe to it.